Economics is the study of how goods and services are produced and distributed. It's a study of unlimited wants in a world where resources are scarce. Economics is a study of human behavior, of how people earn a living and how they spend their money. Economics is a study of society, of how society uses resources from previous generations to satisfy human wants and desires. Economics studies the way individuals make choices. And because society is made up of individuals, economics analyzes the choices made by society. I don't think we'll ever come up with the right definition of economics. So what do you think? Economics. Like, money matters? Money matters? The way money works. Um, I guess it would have to be anything bought, sold, or traded. Well, it's a study of uh, money and systems and how people react to different uh, situations dealing with money. That's an awfully broad question to try and answer in a little soundbite, I think. It's a study of the movements of green pieces of paper. Makes me think of politics. I believe economics is the allocation of uh, scarce resources throughout the world. Economy in the University of Cambridge published the principles of economics. In his introduction to this important textbook that would become the classical reference, he wrote, political economy or economics is a study of mankind in the ordinary business life. It examines that part of individual and social action which is most closely connected with the attainment and with the use of material requisites of well-being. Marshall believed that there were two fundamental forces that directed world history. Those were the religious and the economic. While religious motives were more intense, he argued that economic motives were broader in scope. Because of the significance of economics in our lives, you already know a lot about what economics is. Let's preview some of the concepts you'll study in this class and see how familiar they are to you. Much of economics deals with facts and definitions. These can be quite revealing and interesting to learn. For example, here's a small grocery basket that contains a half a gallon of milk, a pound of butter, a dozen eggs, one pound of potatoes, a loaf of bread, and a roasting chicken. What's the price? Well, today it's about $10. 50 years ago, this same basket of goods cost $2. Of course, the average hourly wage at that time was around a dollar an hour, well, today, it's significantly higher at about $11 an hour. So while the same basket of goods costs five times more today than it did over 50 years ago, wages have increased by more than 10 times. So what it, economists call real terms, the basket of goods today is actually cheaper. In other words, people have to give up less now than they did before. Changes in the price level relate to the study of inflation. Later on in the course, we'll spend more time studying what it causes inflation and how to account for quality differences that may exist between a basket of goods 50 years ago and one today. I'm certain, for example, that there were many products available then that are just no longer available. Just like this $5 calculator with science fiction. Becoming familiar with movements and the levels and rates of change of prices, wages, interest rates, unemployment, and government deficits is important. But often we want to uncover the reasons for these changes. So economics is more than description. Economics is also about economic reasoning. It's a set of tools you can use to analyze and understand economic problems. Economic reasoning compares costs and benefits. When you're thinking about buying a product, you compare what the product costs with how much pleasure, satisfaction, or benefit you'll get from using it. So if the cost is greater than the benefit, it wouldn't be rational to buy it. Well, here's an example of an expensive light bulb. It's energy efficient, and it puts out about the same amount of light as this bulb. This one costs about $5, whereas this one costs about a dollar. 
So why would anyone buy this one? Well, there are several reasons, and all of those can involve comparing costs and benefits. This one uses less energy and lasts about 10 times longer. So, if you expect that energy prices are going to go up, then it might make sense to use this kind of bulb. Since you'll realize the benefits over time, you also have to take that into consideration. In a few weeks, we'll talk about how to discount benefits or costs that are realized over time. Now, there are also environmental benefits from using this type of bulb that are more difficult to quantify, but they're just as real. For instance, you may sleep better at nights knowing you're being friendly to the environment. And how much is that worth to you? Sometimes economists use language in strange ways. For example, the best way to think about the cost of this orange is not in terms of money, but in terms of what you have to forego or give up in order to get the orange. That's called the opportunity cost. Opportunity costs exist because resources are scarce. There's a cost you incur right now by watching this program. What is it? Well, think of the best alternative you can to watching TV. That's what you're giving up. Because time is scarce, time is valuable. The same logic applies to the cost of your education. There are both explicit and implicit costs of obtaining a degree. The explicit costs include tuition and books. The implicit or opportunity costs can be much greater. They include what you might be giving up in order to go to school. So if you could be earning $20 an hour by working instead of studying, that's the opportunity cost of studying. Economic reasoning also involves what's called marginal thinking. When considering whether or not to buy this apple, economists suggest that you don't think about the costs you've already incurred, like the money spent on gasoline to get you to the supermarket. Costs that have already been realized are called sunk costs. So to an economist, bygones are really bygones. All that matters in making an optimal decision are costs associated with the additional or marginal cost of the activity. Historical Moments with John Watkins, Ph.D. Microeconomics traces its origins to the marginalist revolution of the 1870s. Those initiating the marginalist revolution, Stanley Jevons in Britain, Leon Walras in France, and Karl Menger in Austria, and John Bates Clark also in Britain, sought a new answer to an old question. What determines value? Why do some things sell for a higher price than other things? Or to drive the point home, why does water command such a low price and diamonds such a high price? After all, you need water, you don't need diamonds. The classical economist, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and John Stuart Mill asserted that prices are proportional to the quantities of embodied labor. As Adam Smith claims, labor was the first price, the original purchase money that was paid for all things. By the late 19th century, however, even those who had not read Marx understood the implications of the labor theory of value. Labor creates all value, yet labor must share the produce with the capitalist in order to access the means of production. Profits arise from the exploitation of labor. The marginalists rejected the labor theory of value on three grounds. First, they rejected the idea that capitalists contribute nothing, and hence they rejected the whole idea of exploitation. Second, the labor theory of value has some difficulty explaining prices that differ from the quantities of embodied labor. For example, how does one explain the value of those items, the price of which far exceeds the quantity of labor embodied, such as rare paintings, coins, or rents? And third, the labor theory of value in focusing on cost in determining value tends to diminish the role played by demand. Those initiating the marginalist revolution knew that price is determined by supply and demand, but they sought to ascertain what underlies the supply and demand curves. Their answer marks the rise of the subjective theory of value. The notion that what underlies prices is not quantities of embodied labor, but utility. Marginal thinking helps focus attention to the relevant features of a decision. Becoming comfortable with the concept of opportunity costs and marginal analysis can help you make better decisions in your life. 
In this class, we'll also explore economic theory. We'll show how economic models are developed and how models are used to make economic forecasts. You probably have heard about the law of demand. It's an economic model of behavior that states if the price of something goes up, your demand for it will go down. The law of demand works in both directions. So when prices go down, demand goes up. Why does the law of demand work? Partly it's that when the price of something goes down, it becomes cheaper compared to other goods. So people switch away from the higher price good to the lower price good. So when chicken goes on sale, people switch from beef to chicken. That's called the substitution effect of a price change. And partly it's because when prices go down, we feel better off, our dollars can stretch further, so we can afford to buy more. That's called the income effect. The principle of demand ties together the concepts of substitution and scarcity, and it doesn't have to relate to money prices. For example, what grade do you want from this class? I want an A. Well, suppose your answer is an A. Now, how do you earn that grade? By sacrificing a scarce resource, your time, to study. That's the price of the grade. When prices are high, there's a tendency to moderate desire and accept less than we may want. So if an A costs 20 hours a week of study time and a B only costs about an hour a week, you may decide to earn the lower grade. I'll, I'll take a B. At those prices, the B is simply a better deal. Economics is also a study of institutions. Institutions are things that affect economic decisions and outcomes. Since that's a strange definition, let's think about it. Families, for example, are institutions that have significant economic implications. In Utah, families play a big role in determining what we spend our income on. Well, now where do we get our income? When you look for a job, who you know may be just as important as your skill level in determining your wage. So social networks are institutions that are a part of our economic system. Markets are also significant economic institutions where buyers and sellers get together and trade. There are all sorts of markets. Some are physical, like at the supermarket, and some are electronic, like with the stock market. Now there are other ways of talking about markets. Markets can be efficient. In efficient markets, there aren't many exceptional deals. Since that may sound a bit strange, let me explain why what we mean by exceptional deals. For example, in a supermarket, no one is directing which line a shopper chooses. If a checker opens up a register, people move to the new line. Why? To profit or get a good deal in terms of time spent in line. Have you noticed how short lines quickly vanish? Well, that's an abstract way of thinking about market efficiency. In this class, we'll also study economic policy. Policies are actions taken by the government to influence economic outcomes. While some markets are efficient, others aren't. Under the institution of a market, when we want something, we have to give something up so we make a trade. And if we have to give up something we enjoy, like leisure time, we get paid for it. If these transactions or exchanges don't take place, then markets are operating inefficiently. When a smoker enjoys a cigarette, for example, there's a cost to non-smokers. Secondhand smoke is an example of an externality which can give rise to a market inefficiency, which in turn gives rise to government intervention. Utah, for example, has some of the strictest anti-smoking laws in the United States. These laws are designed to protect the rights of non-smokers. Modeling how the government operates in a market economy is another important part of the class. Taxes, for example, are something we're all familiar with. Taxes are used to raise government revenue, but taxes are also imposed on certain goods and services to affect their prices. By increasing the prices of cigarettes via taxation, the government can reduce smoking to accommodate the social costs of smoking. Remember the law of demand? When prices go up via taxation, demand goes down. In physics, scientists learn about the universe by studying subatomic particles. Biologists learn about complex ecological systems by studying microorganisms. How they influence the development of life. In microeconomics, we learn about broad economic patterns by studying the details of consumer and producer behavior. We'll begin with a model of individual behavior and then aggregate across individuals to explain market behavior. However, the whole is different than the sum of the parts. For example, 
If a particular farmer works especially hard and produces a lot of grain, his income can increase and he'll be better off. But what if all farmers behave this way and produce bumper crops? In that case, total income falls because of declining prices. This is an example of the fallacy of composition and is accounted for in macroeconomics. So in macro, we'll study the economy as a whole. Micro looks at the trees, whereas macro looks at the forest. By taking both micro and macro, you'll learn about decision-making and consumer and producer behavior, government policy, international trade, economic growth, and more. These classes provide an important foundation for advanced courses in business, law, or political science. But more importantly, because economics is such a large part of our lives, micro and macro can help you understand society better. The classes can help you interpret our rich history and understand how economic forces motivated political change. One feature that we'd want to explore historically in talking about the current economy is the development of industrialization and industrial capitalism in the United States. Clearly that's a historical topic that goes back into the 19th century and the United States did develop uh, at least a prototype of the capitalist system prior to the Civil War and with the more heavy development of capitalism following the Civil War in 1865. In talking about industrial capitalism, one would have to decide what the central features of industrial capitalism might be. The features that I would emphasize is, one, as the industrial system comes to rely on the factory system, that means that, that labor will be organized in a central place and production will take place uh, in a central place. That begins to emerge in the United States uh, in the 1820s and the 1830s, uh, especially in the textile industry and later on in, in other industries. Another feature of capitalism would be the idea of hired labor for wages, that workers would work for wages uh, and not have ownership of the means of production, the tools and machines that they work with, and not have ownership of the final product this implies that uh, workers uh, would be hired in a production context for wages and immediately raises the question of uh, whether wages are high enough uh, and also raises the question of hours of work and working conditions and creates a, a debate between owners and workers over how the production process would work and a debate over the level of wages, the number of hours and working conditions. As these conditions emerged in the factory system, one can see that the United States is moving to a capitalist system or at least a prototype of the capitalist system if one takes the factory system and labor arrangements as to be crucial features of capitalism. Another crucial feature of capitalism, ownership of the firm, that ownership rests with those that own the capital that formed the firm and they hire labor to carry out production arrangements and uh, actually own the firm, own the tools and machinery, and own the final product at the end and count on selling the final product for profits at the end. And that raises the issue of production for profit as being one of the central features of capitalism. And so the question is historically, when did these conditions arise in the United States? The basic phenomenon is that uh, they arose in the United States quite early. Uh, early in the 1820s and 1830s and 1840s, you see the development of the factory system and other features of capitalism, inc including hired labor, uh, emerging in the textile industry, also emerging in the iron industry, and a wide variety of consumer goods industries uh, in the early 19th century before the Civil War. But they were emerging only in a, in a prototypical fashion because one has to keep in mind that the American economy was also influenced by agricultural production and agricultural production remained in the context of uh, family farm agriculture, uh, at least outside of the American South. That leads to a historical proposition that in the 1850s, American industrialization and American capitalism elaborated very strongly because the 1850s was a decade of substantial growth uh, of American industrial output and uh, American industrialization. And that leads to the phenomenon that uh, up to the Civil War, uh, capitalism was certainly in place. Uh, between 1860 and 1865, uh, the issue was waging the Civil War. 
uh, after the Civil War, uh, American capitalism and American industrialization uh, took off with a, a stronger uh, kind of development and a deeper development of both capitalism and industrial production between 1865 and 1900. Uh, that often means that the late 19th century is described as the period uh, of the industrial swashbucklers, sometimes described as the robber barons, uh, that results in a broad set of industries, production for profit, and large increases in industrial production uh, between the Civil War and the turn of the century. And because our society is becoming increasingly a part of a global community, we've developed the courses with large international components. We'll see how changing economic climates around the world affect our economy in terms of prices, per capita income, employment, and growth. When we talk about an economy growing, it's helpful to distinguish two different aspects of growth. One is just mere growth in the amount of natural resources that get used and the amount of output that gets produced. The other is an increase in the level of economic development. That doesn't necessarily entail using more natural resources, but it means using them in a smarter, more efficient kind of way. Whether bigger is better is somewhat of a moot question because there's no way that the economy can get bigger in the sense of raw growth forever. We have limited natural resources. We have limited land. We're just living on this one planet. There, there has to be a limit to, to growth in this sense. But there doesn't necessarily have to be a limit to development. There's no limit on human ingenuity, for example, when it comes to trying to use the natural resources that we have in, in better ways in order to improve the standard of living. So it's important that we try to keep on developing. But it's also important that we realize that there are limits to the amount of growth an economy can undertake. And ignoring those limits simply means that future generations have a harder time. Let's review the material we've covered so far. We know economics is diverse and is a part of your everyday life. In this class, we will study economic reasoning, and that involves comparing costs and benefits using marginal analysis. What we have to give up in order to get something is called opportunity cost. We will also examine economic models. Models can be used to understand and to predict behavior. The law of demand is an example of an economic model. We'll look at economic institutions, which are structures that affect economic decisions. Corporations are examples of institutions that affect economic behavior. We'll talk about economic policy, actions by the government that affects economic activity. Taxes, for example, may be used to increase the price to reduce demand. During the class, you'll also learn important economic terminology that can help you better participate in economic discussions and understanding. Becoming fluent and comfortable with economic terminology can help you in upcoming classes and, more importantly, can make your life richer. So you can get the most out of your economics telecourse, we put together a packet of class materials and have arranged for interactive discussion sections. The tools of the class include, first, your television. The class broadcast schedule is included in your course packet. During the course, you'll see presentations of economic ideas and have the opportunity to see economists, politicians, and business leaders discuss and often debate important economic issues. When you're watching the class on TV, make sure you have your TV companion booklet. It previews what you'll see broadcast, summarizes the main points of the class, and includes questions to help test your understanding. The TV Companion Guide also includes copies of the important graphics that we use in class and has space to keep your own notes. Graph paper is included so you can duplicate our economic models. A computer can also be an important tool. We encourage you to use your PC or Macintosh software that's included with the course packet. It includes software and instructions that allow you to log on to the World Wide Web economic server at the University of Utah via modem at your home. There are special sections of this server that are just for your class. You can review topics and ask questions via email on your own account. No prior experience with computers is needed, and if you don't have a computer, you can use one during your discussion sections. 
Each week, you're scheduled for a discussion section at one of the remote sites. This is where you can ask questions and participate in lively debates. You'll also take your exams at these locations. Make sure to check your syllabus for the exact dates and times. Finally, your course packet includes a textbook. Broadcast materials are closely linked to the material in the text. It's very important to keep up on your reading so you can better understand the broadcast material. Reading assignments are detailed in your syllabus.